Hello, this is Andrew Haddon, otherwise known as Felix Felix and eToro. In today's video, I'm going to be discussing the topic of building a copier-friendly eToro portfolio. The video is split into several parts. In the first part, I'm going to be talking about who might be interested in this video and who would benefit from watching it. So if that doesn't include you, then you'll know at an early stage you'll be able to bail out. In the second part of the video, I'm going to describe how I would foresee an ideal eToro copier experience should work in theory and in practice. In the next part, I'm going to explain four rules that PI could or should perhaps follow in order to make their eToro portfolio friendly towards copiers, both existing copiers and future copiers. And to illustrate the concepts that I'm going to lay down, I'm then going to move on to several worked examples based on my real world experience of investing in PIs. So although I'm going to be using the virtual portfolio to demonstrate some of this, you can rest assured that in the past I have copied all of these PIs with real money and I've also discussed these situations with other users. So I'm not basing it on theory, I'm basing it on actual practice of my experience on eToro. And you'll see from my PI reviews that I've done in the other videos, I do have considerable experience of analyzing PIs and copying PIs for quite significant amounts of money. So that's my credentials and that's my opening gambit. Hopefully you'll enjoy the video. So who might benefit from a copier friendly portfolio? or to put it another way, who might benefit from watching this video. So the first type of person who might benefit is someone who is looking to copy a PI. Many of my viewers fall into this category. Knowing how to identify a copier-friendly portfolio will allow you to find PIs whose portfolios meet this criteria and therefore whose results you will match closely with. It will prevent difficult decisions and problems arising in future. So that's how this video will benefit a copier. Also, this might be relevant to existing eToro popular investors because the concepts I'm going to be going through in this video could be useful in improving your existing portfolio and making it more accessible and copier friendly. Uh, this is not just work on your part, it will also generate goodwill and could actually end up making more money from you as a result, as well as giving you a warm fuzzy feeling inside. So lastly, uh, it could be for aspiring popular investors, so people who aren't PIs but who would like to become one one day. So in planning ahead to do this, anyone who's looking to build their portfolio with aspiration to become a PI and might want to consider a copier friendly portfolio so that when they do become a PI, they won't need to totally scrap it and start from the beginning again. So these are the three types of people who I think will benefit from this video, but also is relevant to just anyone who's interested in eToro copy trading in general and who's maybe learning about the platform. In this slide, I'm going to explain how I think eToro copy trading should work for a copier. It's a five step process. Searching for a popular investor is the first stage. You can do this by using eToro filters, but remember you may wish to customize and tailor these for your own needs. You can also use word of mouth or any other method you see fit to locate a PI. The main thing is to find someone who you can trust and who fits your style and your risk profile. So once you've done this, you'll be wanting to initiate a copy for an amount that's affordable to you. So this is going to be different for different people. For some people, $200 is a lot of money. To other people, $10,000 is pocket change. Totally depends on you, but you need to find an amount that's affordable to you and a PI who's copyable for that amount. So once you've done this, there should be no constant monitoring. Uh, any actions that are mandatory should be rare or infrequent. So you shouldn't really need to be checking it on a regular basis to find out what you're supposed to be doing. Any deposits and top ups to the copy should ideally be optional and your choice to do so. It shouldn't be because eToro or the PI have told you, you must do this and that in order to remain synchronized with the PI. So assuming you've done this, you've not monitored your account, you would leave the copy for a medium to long term, because as we know, holding for several months, preferably years without tinkering or withdrawing funds from it is the best way to compound and grow your capital. So if you've done the four things here, and if the PI's done the four things here, and also obviously eToro has done their part as well, then at the end of this process, your results should match the PIs. With further action or being either minimal or non-existent on your part, it should be a seamless and automated process that you don't need to really stress about. You just fire and forget, and any further interactions are your choice and not something that the PIs told you to do or the eToros told you to do. However, it doesn't always work this smoothly as we're going to see in the rest of this video. So, hope everyone's still with me. On this slide, I'm going to run through what I consider the four best ways to build an accessible and copier-friendly eToro portfolio. I won't spend too long on each one because I'm going to illustrate it with working examples rather than with theory. 
So the first method would be to become copyable for an affordable amount. Now, ideally, this would be 200, as mentioned previously, but in the real world, sometimes your portfolio gets a little bit fragmented and maybe 500 would be a more reasonable figure. However, when this gets up to 1,000, that is problematic for two reasons. Number one, it's quite a hard amount of money to find for the initial copy. But secondly, it's got a knock-on effect if someone chooses to top up the copy or dollar cost average, which means adding funds monthly or quarterly. Next thing to bear in mind is making infrequent or zero deposits. Ideally, they should not be making deposits and instead should fund future purchases of assets via the existing balance or by selling assets that you've already got in your portfolio. If this is not possible, preferably deposit infrequently. The reason for this is because when you make a deposit, the copier is compelled to match that deposit or to stop the copy and restart. And neither of these situations is ideal because people cannot often find money down the back of the sofa to add to the copy at the drop of a hat and also stopping the copy and starting again incurs spread fees. So the next thing is to keep your portfolio percentages well synced. Now, I will show you examples of this, but the idea is when a copier executes a copy, it copies at the originally invested amount, which may be different from the PI's current value held. So the originally invested amount might be 5% in Bitcoin, the PI might not hold 10% now. This creates what you call a desynchronization and means results won't match. So the closer these two values can be kept, the better. Obviously, they're not going to be identical, but what we don't want is someone who originally bought 5% in an asset and they've now got 50% because that's going to mean your portfolio is going to be very different to the PIs. So it's the PI's responsibility to make sure this doesn't happen. And it's good investing practice anyway to rebalance your portfolio and not let one position become too high a percentage of your overall portfolio even if you leave copy trading to one side. So fourthly, communicating these changes effectively. It may not be possible to follow those three golden rules I've set out. However, if you don't follow them, any deviations in strategy should be communicated clearly to existing and potential future copiers. So those are my four golden rules. And in my upcoming PI review series, season two, which I'm going to announce shortly, I will be judging PIs really quite strictly by those four rules because I feel from my own experience that PIs on eToro who do follow these, it's a far more pleasant copy trading experience as we're going to see in the worked examples that I'm going to give you. On this part of the video, I'm going to demonstrate the concepts I've been covering using three of eToro's top popular investors. Please note that two of these people are currently not copyable but this does not detract from the points I'm making and the examples I'm giving are based on the time when they were copyable and I was actually copying all three for real money. So before I continue, eagle-eyed viewers may spot that I'm using a second private account I've got called the Moody Blue. It hasn't got any money in it and all of my trades will still be done on the Felix Felix account. So anyone looking to communicate with me, to follow me or even to copy me doesn't need to worry. All my business will still be done on the Felix Felix account. This is just for demonstration purposes. So. Jane Nemesis, I believe, is one of the most copier-friendly PIs. Three reasons for this. Reason number one, he was copyable before he hit his 100 million AUM. He was copyable for $300, and I believe that this has been a big part of him managing to get 42,000 copiers. For many years, he was actually copyable for 200. This makes him accessible to everybody, and that's one of the reasons why he's got so many copiers. Secondly, for three years, he didn't put any deposit into eToro, which meant anyone copying him would meet exactly the same results as he was getting or almost exactly without needing to add any funds so this is really copier friendly and the third thing most importantly his currently held value there on the right hand side is very similar to original invested amount so anybody copying jay would get these percentages here on the left and that's very similar to jay's current value so they would be getting a portfolio extremely similar to jay and the way he's done this we'll see by the trades here is by making a lot of trades to keep things rebalanced and although this might seem like a hassle and it is a big hassle you will see that it didn't stop him from getting over 100 percent profit last year so it does show that keeping a well-balanced and synchronized portfolio does not necessarily need to be at the expense of profit although it's obviously less than ideal so that's jay and he is one of the flagship pis for a copy friendly approach Second person here, Heloise Grief. Now, I'll state at the outset, I've got a very high opinion of Heloise, and I think she's a great person to copy. So this is not to be taken as a criticism. However, I just want to point out a couple of differences between Heloise's profile and Jay's, who we've just been looking at. 
The first one is that she needs to be copied for at least a thousand. So this prices out anybody who doesn't have a thousand dollars to invest. And she still managed to get a lot of copiers, which is which is fantastic. But people who don't have a thousand will not be able to copy Heloise. And to be fair, she has pointed this out. She's saying if you don't use a thousand, you won't execute the smaller trades. So she's been open and honest about it. So it's not criticism, but that's just one element where she's not quite so copier friendly. Now the second one. I'm going to demonstrate in a minute, but first I'm going to execute a virtual copy of Heloise for a thousand to show you what I'm talking about. So if you're copying Heloise for a thousand, there you are there, copy. Now this is Saturday when I'm recording that, so it won't actually copy the trades, but that's a copy started. So when I copied Heloise last year for a thousand, one of the first things I saw was she added money to the copy. She added 1.4%, which if you've put a thousand in, then 1.4% is $14. So what I had to do was faced with the decision of I either add $14 to the copy or I become desynchronized with Heloise. Because if I don't add it, then that means Heloise has got $14 or 1.4% because I'm sure her bankroll is a lot bigger than 1,000. <laughs> but she's got 1.4% of free cash that I wouldn't have had. So I was basically forced to add $14. And not only am I forced to do that, I have to add it within a certain time frame before she allocates the money. Otherwise, it's spent, it's gone, and I've missed my chance. So this is how you would do it. You would put 14, don't copy open trades, because remember, this is putting in as cash, press update, and then we've added the amounts now a little bit, you know, 1,014 basically. So that, as you can see, is a little bit of a hassle because if you were copying for a larger amount, if you copy for 10 grand, then you'd be asked to copy, to add 140 to the copy. So that was uh, that there. However, on the bright side, Heloise's portfolio, just like Jay's, is very well synchronized. You can see here, these values are really, really similar. So although it's a minor hassle adding 1% each month, and I don't know if Heloise still does add 1% each month, but although that's a minor hassle, then overall the portfolio is well synchronized and providing someone's got a thousand dollars in their pocket and they are comfortable adding a small amount each month then I think Heloise is still a good person to copy and her communication is really good. So the third person I'm going to look at and it's someone who I've been reasonably critical of in the past but I'm not doing this as anything personal I'm just using this because he's a very good illustration of what I'm talking about. So this is Dean Fredericks. Again, sadly, Dean's not copyable at the moment. Hopefully that copy block at some point will be listed. But I just wanted to show you these three things. So you'll see on his profile here that really he puts it in a certain way, but $2,500 is required in order to capture all Dean's open trades. And the reason for that is because if we look at Tesla there, it's actually, there's some positions that are as small as 0.4% or there were anyway last time I looked. I don't know, maybe he sold some of those ones. But basically, this you can see some at 0 0.06. So the, yeah, they are a little bit uh, bigger now, but basically two and a half grand was needed to fully capture all of Dean's positions. So that creates an initial hurdle to investing. Secondly, again, just like how Louise, when I was copying Dean, this was quite a long time ago, but I found he was regularly adding deposits. So again, I must add those deposits, otherwise I will fall behind what he's doing but by far the biggest issue was was this one here about the invested amounts you can see that the originally invested amount bitcoin's actually his biggest position tesla second but in terms of current value tesla he's got 54 percent in that so his nine percent in tesla has grown to 54 percent so without going over old, old ground what this really means is his portfolio would be very different to the copier's portfolio and if tesla was to rise or fall the copier would not experience those same gains or losses so those are the three reasons why I would have said that that was not as copier friendly a portfolio. But please note that does not mean someone cannot make big profits copying Dean. It doesn't mean Dean's not a good PI. It doesn't mean certainly doesn't mean Dean's not a good investor. What it does just mean is that in terms of these three rules I've set out, it costs a lot to copy him. Uh, the person copying him would have to add regularly to keep up and also the results they would see would be different to Dean's, maybe better, maybe worse. So that's my three worked examples of PIs who have got varying degrees of copier friendliness, if there is such a word. I'd like to finish this video with a worked example of a PI not being clear or accurate with their communication. Now, one girl is someone who I've highlighted in the past for this statement on her bio, which had changed, but is now back again. She's saying minimum to copy all open trades is 3,000. Now, for this to be the case, her smallest position would need to be 0.03%, which is $1. Now, what I am saying is her smallest copyable size is actually 1,000. 
So let's see who's right and who's wrong. So what you need to do to find out is go through all of one girl's currently open positions. And if there is a position smaller than 0.1%, then I'm wrong. But if all of the positions are 0.1% or higher, then I'm right, because 0.1% of a thousand is one dollar. So I won't bore you by going through every single one on this video, but I think you'll find that every single position is 0.1% or higher, which means one girl can actually be copied for 0.1% and all trades will execute properly. But whether it is 1,000 or 3,000, this brings us to a second problem. So the problem is, imagine if you've got a copy of one girl for either 1,000 or 3,000 or any other amount, and you want to add funds to the copy. Maybe you've just got your monthly salary you want to top up. Theoretically, the smallest amount is 100. It will let you do this and copy open trades. This is one that you've instigated, not one that Lena's instigated. However, as I've just shown, this would be a bad idea because it would hardly capture any of the trades. Again, 200 also won't. 500 won't. So you'd actually need to add 1,000 as a top up there to capture all open trades, which means that if you were copying her for 1,000, then your top up would have to be 1,000, which is 100% top up, then 50%, then 33%, and so on. And this really is unworkable for most people. And if it was the case uh, that Lena did need 3,000 to be copyable, then not only would the original copy need to be 3,000, but any subsequent top ups would also need to be 3,000, which as you say, start, see, starts to get really expensive really quickly. Now that's in the case of uh, additions that you're instigating. There is another type of addition, which I can see here that Lena's actually added 9% uh, of her portfolio. I'm not quite sure why, possibly to meet the requirements of the Black Star. Maybe she's gone up to that. And to be fair, she has actually set out a great post there on the consequences of this and what you need to do. So that's an example of good communication. But you can really see by being unclear on this and actually by over egging the pudding by saying 3,000, what she's done is co cost herself copiers because she has 1,000 990 copiers but if you look at someone else um, like well Yeppy Kirk Bond, Mariano Pardo, Heloise, they have all got over 10,000 copiers so I think by setting this bar at 3,000 Lena is really chasing away and deterring copiers so I don't think that's a good thing. Uh, again though on the bright side her portfolio seems really well synchronized apart from the odd position like Spot Spotify, sorry Shopify there and yeah overall it's a mixed bag but this just really shows you that if someone didn't know what they were doing they maybe would think that they couldn't copy Lena unless they had 3,000. And also, even if they knew it was 1,000, if they knew a little bit more, say they watched this video, maybe they don't have 1,000, or maybe they don't have the capacity to add to that at 1,000 a month. So this is some of the problems that can arise. A couple I just wanted to finish with very quickly. Olivier, who I've obviously been critical of in the past, I will give him full some praise here because he is copyable for the minimum of 200. That will capture all positions. Uh, which is great. And also since he's frequently rotating through positions, it would soon, uh, even if you didn't copy open trades, you would soon synchronize. So 10 out of 10 for Olivier on that. But it wouldn't be an Olivier video without a small criticism. If you look in his bio, he actually says the minimum amount is 500. 200 will not take all trades. This is untrue. This is inaccurate information. However, if you put it in light of the rest of the stuff on his bio, I would say maybe it's not out of place. So anyway, uh, next person, Richard Stroud. And I actually found Richard Rosen the best because he's copyable for 200 minimum. And he also does an excellent FAQ there, just really for a beginner's guide to how to add funds and, and how do you know if it's synced. Really, really good by Richard Stroud there. And also his portfolio is really well synced. So I would give Richard a 10 out of 10. In many ways, he seems to be the blueprint for communication with copiers and having a copier friendly portfolio and as you'll see by his amount of copiers 20,000 this really does pay off even though he's not been on eToro as long as some of the people like Lena uh, he hasn't been on eToro as long but he has 10 times as many copiers as Lena uh, his results aren't any better than, than Lena's in fact I think they're lower results but admittedly he takes less risk uh, but you really will see by being copier friendly you will actually reap the benefits and be more successful as a result. So hope you've enjoyed this video. And by any means, if you have any PI who you'd like me to have a look at and tell you whether I think they're copier friendly, then do so. Pop the comment in the chat box. Really enjoy making this video and I hope it's one that will get a lot of views. I think it's really valuable that anyone in eToro knows about this information. Please bear in mind, these are just rules that I've made up. That's my definition of copier friendly. That's only from my perspective, but as someone who's copied PIs for large and small amounts of money, I really think by following the rules that I've set down in this video, 
It will make PIs better and more copy friendly. It will be really useful for copiers and it will also be really useful for aspiring PIs. So thanks again. Hope you enjoyed the video. Look forward to reading your comments in the comments section on YouTube. Thank you very much for sticking it out to the end if you did.